Hey everybody, Pastor Cal here. I hope you are as excited as I am to check out this passage tonight. Uh, we're going to be finishing up the book of First Thessalonians. So we're looking at chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. Um, when I first, when I used to read this passage, uh, I used to think of it kind of like these random thoughts from Paul's head. I couldn't really see much order to it. But now that I've been studying it um, this past week, I've, I'm starting to see a bit more of the logic, I think, behind what Paul is writing. So ultimately, he wants the Thessalonians to have peace, which is the natural um, outcome, the natural uh, result when God's people are living in holiness. But of course, um, there are some obstacles to that peace that Paul um, kind of predicts might be happening. So he provides some really straightforward tips um, that they can use to confront those obstacles to their peace. Um, the peace that comes from the working out of God's uh, holiness in our lives. I think the most important thing about this passage really is precisely that, the call to holiness. So I want to spend a few minutes up front um, talking about that. Um, and also because every once in a while I know people don't always watch to the end of these videos. Um, I'm certainly guilty of that myself from time to time. So let's talk about holiness. I've been part of what's called the holiness tradition uh, for my entire life in three or four different denominations, depending on how you want to count. But I haven't always understood exactly what that has meant. Uh, so to give you just, uh, and our, our church is also uh, part of the holiness tradition, so I, I definitely think it's worth touching on. To give you just a little uh, context, a little background, the holiness traditions um, trace their roots back to a guy named John Wesley, who lived in England mostly in the 1700s. Uh, but really, the reason why Wesley's thoughts and ideas were so powerful is because he was heavily shaped by um, recently available writings from largely Greek-speaking uh, Christians in the Eastern Christian um, uh, Empire. And these traditions had always strongly emphasized the real possibility for holiness in the life of a Christian. So I want to just touch on uh, two things really for, that for me I think are the, the most important um, and the most exciting things um, about holiness and focusing on holiness in the life of a Christian. First of all, it reminds us, it shows us, it reveals that there is so much more to the Christian life after the moment of justification or salvation. There is so much growth that happens after we accept Jesus as our Savior. In fact, that moment of justification, when we are um, made just as if um, we had never sinned before God, that's just the beginning of our Christian journey. Some Christians, certainly I know in my um, background as a Christian, um, struggle to kind of fit in good works or good deeds with their Christian life when they know that they're saved apart from good deeds and those don't have anything to do with their salvation. Well, I think a proper understanding of holiness for us, the way that Bi the Bible talks about it, shows that um, actually good deeds do have a place as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul says um, in one of his other letters. And of course, as the, we um, begin to become more aware of the Holy Spirit at work within us. Number two, the second thing that I think is really exciting and, and beautiful about this focus, this emphasis on holiness, is the fact that we ourselves can actually become holy. We see this in uh, several of Paul's letters, not this one, other letters where he writes to the saints in a certain city, and that word saint just means holy people, right? This idea that we can actually change on the inside because the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts. We don't have a, de a time for a detailed discussion about it here, but different Christian traditions 
um, have articulated or tend to articulate the effects of Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection quite differently than this uh, holiness tradition would do it. You might be familiar with one of the ideas that um, we that the blood of Jesus covers us, sort of like this force field, so that when God looks, he doesn't actually see us, he sees the blood of Jesus covering us. But that means we aren't really changed as people. We're still the same dirty, old, rotten sinners who sin every single day, right? Um, of course, this this image is very biblical. Um, it comes from the Old Testament, the Passover, where the Israelites painted the blood of the lamb above the door. And so the blood covered them, protected them from this angel of death that was going over. But it's not the full picture. It's not even really half of the picture. It, it misses out on so much of God's plan, and especially what happens at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and um, changes everything. So some of the words that are thrown around, you can look these up later if you'd like, are um, imparted versus imputed righteousness. Um, but the holiness traditions of Christianity, excuse me, in addition to these Greek-speaking Eastern Christian traditions, have always emphasized um, the real possibility of changed lives, the possibility that Christians can actually grow in holiness, grow in becoming more like Jesus, um, and that the work of Christ actually changes us, not just the way that God sees us, although that's also part of the picture too. So now you've heard my spiel on holiness. Um, you can tune out, but don't stop the video now. I'd love it if you stick around. And let's work our way through his passage systematically. So the, one of the first things we see is Paul mentions um, these people who labor among you, these people who work among you, which is shorthand for ministers like me. It's cool to note, I think, that these leaders in the church, these early leaders were ad hoc um, because this is long before any um, official, formalized clergy had been set up in the church, which shows us a lot about this community, this young Christian community at Thessalonica. Next, um, perhaps obviously, um, Paul talks about peace. He, he, he exhorts them towards peace, which suggests or indicates to us that they're um, is some type of discord or some uh, lack of peace uh, uh, going on with the, with the Thessalonians. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I think Paul's instructions in verse 14 about urging, admonishing, encouraging, he loves these, these different words with different kind of um, f nuances of what's going on. I think that these words flow out of his desire that they would have peace. And peace, of course, comes from God. It's something God gives us, but it's also something we have to work towards, right? Which is why Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. So now, uh, verse 15, next, we're, we're moving on this theme of, of peace, but but the obstacles that come to peace and how what we can do about this peace in our community and how holiness needs to work itself out. This verse 15 um, is one of those ones that I've read so many times that it's kind of lost its effect. And I, and I wonder if that might be similar for some of you, this idea of not repaying evil with evil. Uh, we tend to take this in its most extreme form, I think. So we think of killing and stealing and adultery, etc. But remember, this letter is written in the context of a family. An intimate family conversation is happening here. So often, evil actually consists of very small nuanced actions that 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 lead to other things later on it might be ignoring someone if they ignore you or um, making somebody's life harder if they make your life harder or just kind of saying mean things about them if you if you get offended or if, if something comes between you we're going to come back to this idea of evil when we get to verse 22 but i just want us to be thinking about what that might actually mean for us not repaying evil for evil um, these people weren't killing each other. So what could Paul have meant by this? 
Now, verses 16, 17, 18. These are some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And I have literally preached entire sermons on each one of them. So I'm going to do my very best to keep this uh, concise. Rejoice always. How can we do this? It's crucial, I think, to distinguish between the joy that Paul is talking about here, which is of God, and the happiness that our culture, the culture around us talks about, which is hugely contingent upon our circumstances, okay? The joy of the Lord is ultimately beyond us. It's much bigger than us. And I like this picture of the sun above the clouds to help us wrap our minds around this. Just like the sun never actually stops shining, just the clouds get in the way, so also God never stops loving. He never stops being good. He never stops being God. And that is one of the greatest reasons we have to always rejoice and be joyful. Next, pray without ceasing. This one might be a little trickier. Tons of Christians throughout the centuries have wondered about this and and what it actually looks like. If you've never read the tiny book called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, I would really encourage you to do that because it talks about exactly these things. But I think there's actually a really simple way um, for us to look at this, a really practical way. Um, If prayer is a conversation with God, fundamentally, we have to remember to give God space and time to talk with us. One Christian has said that the neglected half of prayer is listening or, or silence. And I think that is exactly spot on. When we're talking with God, so many of us, I think, often just tend to talk at God with our requests or demands and don't give space, the time for God, uh, the, the focus, the, the, the um, attentiveness for God to talk to us in his half of this back and forth conversation. And I think that is one of the main keys to understanding how we can pray, how we can carry on a conversation with God throughout the day. Um, finally, we have give thanks in all circumstances, which is such an amazing habit um, to develop. And we can talk a lot more about that later if you'd like. Perhaps the most striking thing about these three well-known um, kind of exhortations is the fact that Paul says these are God's will for us. Sometimes when Christians are talking about God's will, it can get really complicated or, or heavy or, or difficult. But Paul is saying this is precisely what God's will is. This is what he wants us to do. This is what holy people look like. They're people who rejoice always, who pray without ceasing, who give thanks in all circumstances. Now we come to verse 19. What on earth does it mean to not quench the spirit? This word is strongly associated with fire, which of course makes sense um, when we think about the other references to the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture, uh, and especially the picture we get at Pentecost. And I'm sorry for this little tidbit, but I have to say it. This exact same word, extinguish, is used in Matthew 25, which we looked at last week, to describe how the flames of the virgin's lamps uh, go out. The image here we get really fundamentally is kind of water being thrown on a fire. All this is connected with light and how we are to see well in this dark age we're living in. Paul is saying that we desperately need the Spirit to live as holy children of the light or of the day, as we saw earlier in chapter 5. Remember, the, the, in the Old Testament, we hear the word is, is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our paths. Um, and of course, the Holy Spirit burns on oil. This is really cool, and I wish we could talk more about this, but oil has tons of... Um, uh, the, the lamp, this idea of the lamp, the Holy Spirit, has tons of uh, imagery of, of anointing, uh, Psalm 23, right? You know my head with oil. Psalm 133, the oil running down Aaron's beard because the Holy Spirit makes us like priests. We are um, uh, a holy priesthood, 
uh, for God. Um, but these these are really this this short verse has gets into some really profound mysteries about the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and how that works. Because it, sometimes in popular Christianity, people have the idea that the Holy Spirit kind of comes and goes or fills us or, or or we get low on the on the spirit and we have to get filled up but that's not how the bible talks about it um it's not some type of magical fairy that comes and goes uh those of you who have who maybe like the outdoors um whoever rekindled the fire in the morning would know that some the, the oftentimes there's heat enough heat there in the coals to get the fire going even after you've extinguished it the night before and i think we're told not to extinguish the spirit, um, but it's still there within us, and it can always be rekindled. Uh, verse 22. This one's really interesting. A lot of, um, well, the some translations say abstain from every appearance of evil. My preferred translation is either every form of evil or every, every manifestation of evil. And it's quite ironic, I think, that this verse has been so important to, well, the holiness traditions in Christianity and other conservative um, traditions as they're thinking about holiness, but for really the wrong reasons. Many have understood this verse to say basically, stay away from everything that looks evil, which means that they've developed certain stances about um, dancing and and going to the movies and alcohol and um, playing cards and stuff like that. But that interpretation comes from really just a misunderstanding about the English word appearance. So people think that it's saying um, avoid whatever appears to be evil, but what this verse is actually trying to say, what the original translators in the King James Bible were trying to get at was this, avoid evil wherever it appears okay wherever it is found wherever it is manifested in whatever form it takes coming back to this idea of evil now we've talked about it before i think that the greatest irony here is actually that many of the things that people in our culture um think look the most evil are not and remember the pharisees accused jesus of just these things all sorts of stuff that they thought was wrong it looked wrong to them but it wasn't and while many of the things that look normal to the world around us are actually evil because they pull us away from God's will for our lives, from what the way that God wants us to be holy, um, whether that's uh, working too much on the Sabbath day or, or going into unnecessary credit card debt or, or maybe even watching too much Netflix. I don't know. But ultimately, we don't really want to trust what the world thinks looks like evil anyway. Because we're concerned about what God wants for our lives, which has a different kind of um, compass oftentimes. I've already talked about holiness quite a bit, so I'll keep this last part brief when we get to verse 23 here. But it talks about um, God sanctifying us entirely, which is really um, important for a lot of reasons. Uh, it, it relates to the place of sin in our lives and a lot of... Um, Christian traditions have, have talked about this. You might have heard the phrase entire sanctification. Um, but the most important thing I think to touch on is verse 24. It's very clear that God is the one who does this. So it doesn't matter how hard we pray or how long we've been a Christian or whatever. It's it's ultimately up to God is the one who who sanctifies us completely or wholly. Now, there's another angle here that is not talked about um, very much, but I think it's it's worth noting because it connects to some other passages we've been looking at recently. And it's this. The letter was written to a group of people. This is, once again, a family setting. So we the word is in the plural there. May the God of all peace sanctify, it would be you all entirely. And so we can read it, I think, as, as God saying, everybody in your group, your church, he's going to sanctify you entirely. And this matches up very closely with what we've read in Zechariah chapter 14 and the picture we get of the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation chapter 21. Finally, um, I want to touch the holy kiss. Uh, this is easy to kind of pass over, but once again, it's an indication of the family-like 
intimacy that existed in this community and other early Christian communities, and also why I think it is probably better to translate Paul's frequent use of brothers, um, the Greek is Adelphoi, um, as family. And that's how um, N.T. Wright does it in his translation. I really like that. So rather than some Bibles say brothers and sisters, I think I like this idea of Paul saying family because that's really the thrust of what's going on here. That's all for now. Uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.